Welcome back. I realized that first half went a bit longer than I expected, so I am going to have to make a few adjustments. Um, the second half for today will mostly just talk about atmospheric circulation. And then with the modern climate of Antarctica lecture that I will put out on Wednesday, I will talk more about oceanic circulation. In the first half of the lecture, I gave an overview of the basics of Earth's climate and solar radiation. Today, we'll talk a little bit about what this means for how what this means for what actually happens with air circulation and how that affects Antarctica. So solar radiation fundamentally causes air to move. Once air gets heated up, it moves, and it's going to move in a gradient. Warm heat wants to anthropomorphize it. Heat wants to go where there is less heat. And with, Earth's, with Earth getting the most intense solar radiation at the equator, there's going to be more, there's going to be a buildup of heat at the equator and very little of it at the poles. What that means is that heat is going to find a way to make its way to the poles. And fundamentally, the way it does is a convection current. Convection involves air or another fluid transferring heat as matter. Um, an example of a more home setting for a convection current would be if you have a room that's hypothetically airtight, you don't have air coming from the outside. It's obviously there's going to be some air, but you have um, a, a radiator causes heat to rise. Um, it will eventually cool down in this case from interaction with the cold window. And as it cools, it will fall down. Um, and in this case, travel across a flat surface until it reaches another heat source. Um, and that is basically what happens with Earth. Hot air rises at the equator, um, travels in the atmosphere until it cools down, and then travels across the surface of the Earth until it heats up sufficiently again to rise. Um, and heat transfer is an interesting topic because it can actually occur three different ways. We spent the first half part of this lecture talking about how heat is radiated out into space, um, how the sun emits electromagnetic radiation and that can travel through the vacuum of space and ends up at Earth. That is the only method of heat transfer that can be done without matter. Um, once that radiate, once that energy is at, is at the Earth, there's a couple of ways that it can move. Heat transfer can occur via conduction if you touch yourself, if you if you burn yourself on a stove, or if you're say sitting on an sitting sitting on an ice block, you will feel yourself getting colder because heat is transferring on a gradient from the warmer object you to the colder object um, the ice, and that is often how heat is transferred. However, in terms of larger scale climate patterns, heat is circulated by a fluid. That fluid is air, and you may not think of air as a fluid, but remember that fluids can be both gases or liquids. They're any substance that doesn't have a, sh um, that doesn't have a fixed form. And air, air can cycle and carry heat with it the same way that water can. Boiling water is essentially carrying, carrying heat from the heat source, aka the stove, and the hot water rises to the top of the top of the pot and carries energy with it. This happens in the mantle as well. Um, hot magma from hot hot magma is heated by Earth's center and rises in the mantle, and then will sink again as it gets cooler. Um, this was originally envisioned in the Earth to look something like this. Hot air rises at the equator in what's called the simply the simple Hadley cell method, which spoiler is not the is not the presently agreed upon method of heat transfer. It is not quite as simple as this. But the idea was that hot air rises at the equator, travels, you'll notice it's 3D. It, it travels towards the pole kind of up in the atmosphere and then once it gets cold enough, it sinks at the poles. However, that still allows some heat transfer to the pole because there's still going to be there's still going to be some heat in this in this air. So, it allows for a net heat transfer to the pole overall, even though you have cold air falling at the pole. You'll notice these these lines showing surface flow also. Um, that shows you that the air is traveling across the surface of the Earth at the surface of the Earth from the pole back to the equator, where it can be heated up again um, at the equator. This is not actually quite what happens. The reality is that the air is going to cool very rapidly once it rises up. Um, so it rises up, 
um, because hot air rises. But then once it's away from the influence of the infrared radiation coming from Earth, it will cool much too rapidly to reach the pole. So what ends up happening is a system more like this, where you have air rising at the equator, and then it will get about as far as 30 degrees north before it will fall again. Um, what happens at 30 degrees north is that you actually have, you have, if you look at this diagram, you'll notice that there is a circulation cell on either side of the equator that takes air up into the air and then drops it down at 30 degrees north or 30 degrees south, and that air subsequently travels back towards the equator. You'll notice that there is another circulation cell in which air rises around 60 degrees north um, or south, and that rising air is then either transmitted to the pole or to 30 degrees south. So there's kind of a there's kind of a mini there's there's in the middle of each hemisphere there's kind of another mini equator of sorts. Um, where, where, where air is rising. And this does ultimately involve a net transfer of heat to the poles because the air masses, because the air masses when they're bumping up against each other, the air particles can transfer energy to one another and the energy will slowly make its way from the equator to the poles. But it's, it's a multi-part conveyor belt as opposed to just a single conveyor belt taking everything on a continuous loop from the equator to the poles. What this fundamentally means is that this heat transfer is a lot slower than you would get with the simple Hadley model like we had in the last slide. And you'll notice for one thing that these lines are not straight, they're curved. That is from the Coriolis effect. You'll also notice again that these are 3D cells. It's important in which direction the air is moving over the land and in which direction the air is moving high up in the atmosphere. It's kind of hard to see on this diagram, but you want to consider at each latitude, do you have air rising overall or do you have air dropping? At the equator, you have air rising. 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south are where the air drops. 60 degrees north and south are where air rises. At the poles, air is dropping. If air is dropping, that's high pressure. If air is rising, that's low pressure. Now, this map shows this map, I'm going to kind of build each cell with you and click through this because I want you to take a look at how the 3D diagrams correspond to air flowing over the surface of the Earth. It's all defined by latitude because remember at the same latitude throughout the Earth, you're going to have about the same about the same weather. The poles, the equator, 30 degrees, 90 degrees. Latitude defines everything. Um, going from a low pressure zone to a high pressure zone, what you have what you have in the Hadley cell is the air rises at the equator and it is physically traveling from 30 degrees to the equator over the land. And it's not going in a straight line, you notice. That is because of the Coriolis effect. But what's happening at the equator is that you have these air masses converging at the equator where they will begin to be heated up and rise again. Um, one reason the equator is, is such a difficult place to, place to navigate for sailors and known as the doldrums is because you have air blowing towards it, but never quite reaching it. You have very little air, you have very little wind at the equator itself because the, the winds are being drawn ever closer and closer to the equator by the Coriolis effect, but they don't quite reach it. Um, likewise, you'll notice that, you'll notice that air is going away from this high pressure zone. And that's one thing you want to think about. Um, air is going to be coming towards low pressure zones because low pressure means there's not a lot of air. Um, air is going to flow from high to low pressure. Um, and at these high pressure latitudes, you have the air flowing away. That is where the air from the equator falls and subsequently makes its way back to the equator, or it makes its way to 60, or it makes its way to 60 degrees north. And this is kind of how a lot of the circulation occurs, actually. Air, the air will fall at one of these high pressure latitudes. And at the 60 degree lat high pressure latitudes, that air can either go towards the, it will either start to go towards the poles or it will go back to the equator. And this is what long-term facilitates heat, heat transfer. And you'll see that the, the hemispheres are kind of symmetrical. You have high pressure zones at the same latitudes on either side. The poles are both high pressure zones. Um, 
at the pole, you have air falling and moving away from the pole and out towards the edges. Um, in Antarctica, that's what causes the catabatic winds. You have air falling at the falling at the South Pole itself and traveling out in all different directions, creating a really strong pressure gradient from the interior of the continent um, out towards the edges of the continent. A key point that will be helpful when you do the circulation lab next week, the winds are named from the direction they come from. So if they're, so for example, the polar easterlies are, the winds are coming from the east and going towards the west, and so they're called easterly winds. Um, and what you want to think about is that the, when the air rises, it's going to get colder. And when it gets colder, it's not going to be able to hold water as well. And we'll talk about that in a moment and why that relates to the equator being rainy. And also for that record, why the 60 degrees north and 60 degrees south latitudes are also rainy. You have, you have that's roughly where the, that's where the Pacific Northwest is. And that's a colder rainy area. Um, and let's get to the Coriolis effect because I've been talking about that and alluding to that as why the lines, why, why these air masses don't travel in straight lines. The Coriolis effect exists because the earth is rotating. Um, and the Coriolis effect simply states that if you have a mass, um, if you have a, if you have an object that gets released as a projectile, it's going to, it's going to, when it gets released, anything on the earth is experiencing, it's, we're, we're rotating with the earth. Something that gets released into the, into the air, a projectile, like a paper airplane or a cannon, when it gets released into the air, it keeps the same momentum it had when it was on the ground. In other words, it's, we are rotating along with the earth and we don't really notice it when a projectile gets launched into the air, it's going to keep the momentum of the same spot it was when it was launched. And let's talk about why that's important. It really has to do with the fact that the equator is spinning a lot faster than the poles. Really, the Coriolis effect needs to be understood with the two different hemispheres involved. So this all comes down to the fact that different points on Earth spin at different rates, and particularly that the equator is going to be spinning a lot faster than anything else. Why is the equator spinning faster than anything else? It's all about time and longitude. If you think about it, the all the points along, say, the Greenwich Meridian are going to come, they're going to reach the next day at the same amount of time, and the Earth spins over the course of a day. The equator is, in a sense, going to have to spin a lot faster for a point on the equator to reach that same, to, to come to the come to the new day at the same time as all the other points on that line of longitude do. So if you're at the pole or near the pole, it will not be required to spin as fast to get back to the starting point in that same amount of time. The poles can rotate slower. The fundamental thing is that the equator is rotating fastest, and that's true with a top too. A top is going to, it's going to anything, it's going to rotate fastest at its biggest bulge um, and rotate a little more slowly at its narrower bulge. Now, I mentioned before that the Coriolis effect is all about momentum and conservation of momentum. Let's say that you have a cannon that's being released, a cannonball is released from a cannon at the equator. That cannonball is going to have a, it's going to have, if you're shooting it straight towards the North Pole, that's your intention, it's going to have a northward velocity. Um, however, it is also going to have a horizontal velocity, even if you're shooting it straight. What you don't realize is that when you're standing on the equator, you and the cannon and the cannonball are all moving at the same rate. Um, from left to right, you'll notice the you'll notice, and you want to pay attention to the direction of the Earth's spin because that controls the Coriolis effect. Now, the cannonball is left continuing at, continuing at its initial velocity. As this hypothetical cannon travels north, it's going to be traveling over land that is traveling at a much that that, that land is rotating at a slower rate. As one as one goes from the equator towards the North Pole the earth is spinning slower and slower and slower 
as you go from the equator to the North Pole. So what that means is that the Earth underneath this cannonball is spinning slower as you go north and north and north. The cannonball is still spinning as if it were at the equator. It's still, even though it's moving north, it's also, to anthropomorphize it a bit, it's trying to continue to spin with the equator. But what that does is that puts it off course. In the northern hemisphere, since the Earth is rotating from left to right, this means that instead of this expected path, we're going to end up with this path, with this actual path in which the new direction lies from our, from from this from the perspective of the object itself and from the from the perspective of the starting path the deflection has occurred to the right and you have to be careful with this because saying something is to the right or the left is in reference to the original expected path if the earth were not spinning, this expected path would have happened. The cannonball would have simply continued north. But the earth is spinning and different points on the earth are spinning at different rates. Now, why is the direction reversed in the southern hemisphere? Why do you end up with a deflection to the left of the expected path in the southern hemisphere? That's because in the southern hemisphere, the earth is still, the earth is still spinning in the same direction. Um, but What's going to happen is that since you're kind of facing the other way now, you're facing you're facing south, the the actual path is going to be trying to kind of follow follow a point on the equator as if it were still moving at its same rate and its same direction. The earth spins from left, the earth spins from left to right. And so as an air mass gets closer and closer to the south pole, it's going to be going over slower and slower terrain. And from the perspective of the original direction, you're going to be moving to the left. And this is something you have to be very careful about. You have to know which hemisphere you're in. You have to, you have to realize what the original direction would be. A very good starting point for the Coriolis effect is to think about, okay, where would this go if there were no rotation? Where, where would this, how would this, massive air move if Earth were not rotating. And please come to me if you have trouble with this, because it's something that I've only come to understand over time, going over it over and over again. And it's something that can be hard to visualize, especially on a diagram like this, because this doesn't show the Earth spinning. And this is happening because the Earth is spinning, because the Earth, different points on the Earth are spinning at different rates. So that's why these masses of, so that's why these masses of air get curved. Now, how to explain rainfall and why, and ultimately we're going to explain why the poles are so dry. But the a new concept I want to introduce is relative humidity. And one way to think about water vapor in the atmosphere is that water vapor is just one of many gases in the atmosphere. It's at most a couple point a couple percentage points of the atmosphere. It's just one of many gases. It is one component of a solution of gases. And the atmosphere can actually hold different amounts of water vapor at different temperatures. Hot air can hold a higher amount of water in gas form before it all condenses and falls out as rain or snow. Now, warm air has a higher capacity than cold air in terms of how much water it can have. As air rises in the atmosphere, it's going to cool. It's going to get colder. And that's going to bring the relative humidity closer to 100% closer to the dew point. When it reaches the dew point, dew means you have liquid water. Well, you're going to get rain. The water is going to basically fall out of the air mass and fall to the ground as rain. And this is happening as the air mass is rising before it starts really traveling horizontally across the Earth's surface. The air is going to lose the water where it came from, essentially. And what happens in low pressure zones where air is rising is that you have not only air being sucked up, well, not being sucked up, not exactly, but air rising, but you have water, but you have clouds, you have clouds forming as the water can no longer stay in liquid form and you have rain forming. Um, high pressure zones, in contrast, are areas where the air mass is falling back to earth. And it is usually going to be, it's usually going to be 
it's going to start out as a mass of dry, cold air. It's falling because the air has gotten too cold to stay in the atmosphere. It might start to get warmed up by Earth's surface a little bit, but there's going to be very little moisture in it because the mass of air will have lost all of its moisture when the, oops, my cat literally stepped on my keyboard. Um, it will have lost all of its moisture when the air rose at the low pressure zone. Low pressure means that air is being taken away. High pressure means that air is falling. So what does this mean? Well, this is why we get rainfall at the equator and also at the temperature, excuse me, at the temperate rainforests in places like in places like Seattle um, at 60 degrees north and south. Um, rain falls down in high pressures, excuse me, in low pressure zones. And wherever that air will lose all of its moisture there, continue to go over the, continue to go, travel high up in the atmosphere and it will eventually fall down. And where it falls down, you will have a desert. 30 degrees north and south, AKA where the air that rises at the equator ends up, those areas tend to be complete deserts. That's true of the North American desert, the Sahara desert, and it is also true of Antarctica. Antarctica is a desert because Antarctica is a high pressure zone. Remember that the poles, if you look at those air circulation diagrams, they are where air that rises at 60 degrees north and south, that air will fall at the poles. The poles are a dry high pressure zone. Whatever, there's very, very little water in the air and you get very, very little net precipitation of any kind at the poles. They are essentially deserts. And the Antarctic is actually one of the world's largest deserts, even though it's not really thought of as such. I was talking about how you'll notice that the deserts are often at the same latitudes at the same point on Earth. You have the Great Basin Desert at about the same latitude as the Sahara, the Arabian Desert, and the Gobi, going farther, going in the Southern Hemisphere. You have the Patagonian Desert, the Kalahari Desert, and the Great Victoria Desert, all at about 30 degrees south. And then you have the two polar deserts. You have, you have, you have essentially, you essentially have the equator and then you get, you get like a mini equator. You get, you get like a mini equator at 60 degrees north and 60 degrees south. 30 degrees south and 30 degrees north are deserts because they're high pressure. And the same is true of the poles. And this is ultimately why Antarctica is so dry because Antarctica is in a high pressure zone. This also is why Antarctica has such strong winds which is something we will get more into next lecture. I do apologize for this taking as long as it did. Um, we will continue with ocean circulation and ocean circulation in Antarctica for next lecture. And we will talk about climate research in Antarctica. We will start to talk about studying climate change in Antarctica for next lecture also. Until then, and hope you're enjoying the class so far.